ever since I was young, I had two deep fascinations. The first was with language and knowledge, particularly with technology. And the second was with nature. Um, in my heart, uh, the second one was always the context for the first one. So that whenever I saw technology that I recognized as harming nature, uh, I immediately had a question about it. Now, I didn't always see that immediately because the fascinations of technology to my young mind were exotic and uh, extreme. And also, I read a lot of science fiction, a great deal of it. Uh, and that really glorified uh, our relationship with technology and possibility of space travel, meeting other intelligences, and this kind of thing. Um, pioneering adventures, uh, very exciting to the minds of young men, as they should be. Um, it's unfortunate that for most of us, they'll be fed fictions of such things rather than direct experiences of them, which <laughs> we happen to be in one of the best places in the universe to have. So it's ironic that uh, rather than having experiences that surpass any stories that can be written or fascinate us, which is certainly our birthright and our situation, um, we've kind of become enmeshed in a variety of perspectives that prohibit all that and sell us back uh, broken myths that remind us of what we might have become while prohibiting us from becoming it. <laughs> it's The irony of it is staggering. Of course, I couldn't realize any of this as a child or a young man. What I realized was that um, truth was in living relationships and living places and the humans had some games they were playing on top of that some of which were fascinating many of which were deadly almost all of which were conflicted nonetheless I was human and fascinated by language mathematics to the degree I could understand it but uh, when computing was born uh, I became obsessed with computation and particularly the idea of artificial intelligence. I felt, I sensed, I intuited, there was an urgency in me to become involved in that idea and the processes that might result in its emergence in our culture. And I had every reason to believe that computers were an astonishing and wonderful new thing. Uh, and one of my, of course, introductions to them was video gaming. And through, I sort of fell into the world of technology and uh, nature remained the context in my heart and uh, <laughs> my occasional forays into it from within the belly of the machine. But I became completely, how shall I put it, oriented in the technological world, especially with my vocation. <clears throat> and of course, in time, that would break down and I would return to nature. And my long association with technology, in particular computing technologies, networking and publishing technologies, and the internet, uh, has given me peculiar perspectives on our relationships uh, with the possibilities and the realities of um, machines and what we do with them, why we do it, how we do it, uh, what we promise and what we get and the difference between the two. <clears throat> but the other Day, I was noticing a phenomenon that has always fascinated me uh, in observing crows, one of my favorite creatures to observe. 
I notice that uh, they tend, although there are exceptions, they sometimes travel in groups during the day, they tend to travel in small uh, pods, three to five, seven birds, and they range over a terrain, and um, they're, they're fairly common where I live, so I get to see a few of them almost every day, and I can hear them regularly. But in the evening, things change, especially around sunset. There's some kind of daily rituals that happen, although they are not rituals. They're just the crows being crows, being animals, being alive. Um, they gather for a while in the sun, and other birds have similar behaviors that seem very special, actually. They gather together near the sunset. And, you know, in, in my um, poetic sense, it seems as though they are recognizing that the day comes to an end and uh, enjoying uh, the peculiar spirit of twilight, which is in some sense, the gap between worlds. But I noticed that at night they do another thing. They make a, <laughs> they make a thing I call multi-bird. And they get together in a mass and they fly off somewhere distant. distant and I've never been able to follow a multi-bird to where it goes. Or seen, you know, where it is that they spend the night in that group. And they must awaken in that group and then perhaps travel a bit as, a, as the group and uh, break up into pods and experience the day. Now, of course, <clears throat> when they're broken up into pods, uh, they're a little bit more like individual birds. Yeah. And so there's hierarchy and conflict and, you know, trouble. Uh, between birds, there's... Um, scapegoat birds and, uh, you know, dominant birds and all kinds of birds, I think, from watching them, yeah, you can see the sort of behavior. So one imagines that during the day there are adventures and relations and interactions that produce uh, some stress and, and restructuring. And then when they make the multi-bird, mo a lot of that seems to dissolve and maybe a few of the longer running or more intense uh, problems or um, friendships right, remain expressed in multi-bird. And I find this really fascinating because uh, in our city-like cultures, which are based entirely on fictions, ideas have replaced relationships and economies uh, have re replaced the treasures of relation, really. But here in the cities, we do something kind of weird. We, um, we go into little boxes, and inside there we might be kind of multi-person. And then in the daytime, we either go around in little pods, a bit like birds, you know, like on the streets and things, gangs, kids and stuff. Uh, or perhaps retired people, well, uh, tourists, <laughs> spectators. Um, but when we form multi-bird, multi-person, right, it's for fiction. We go from our homes, which are in boxes, not in the world, uh, and in those boxes, a fake calendar and phony time obtains. Along with the relations, we've fictionalized time itself, what it means and is in nature, as nature, as animals, which we fundamentally are, no matter what kind of conceptual overlays we prefer. Uh, so we go from our homes into fake collectives, uh, driven by ideas we didn't invent, in fact, we, in many cases, uh, we applied to be subjugated to them. Uh, we requested to become compliant uh, 
and then to be rewarded for this compliance, or at least to be relieved of punishment for such compliance. Uh, because in our culture, that, that difference is very slim for nearly everyone, right? The difference between being rewarded for compliance and activity with some fictional collective and simply working and, and, and complying in order to not be subjected to harm. Because unless you're really wealthy, um, most of your work is going to go just to not subjecting you to harm. Just to keeping a sort of baseline where you're not being actively destroyed by a context too toxic, inhuman, and fictional for any sane or heartful person to function in. <laughs> so we've got something backwards here. We, um, we are fairly excellent at forming and serving and complying with fictional collectives, reactive subcultures, little tiny pods of estranged from reality, uh, <laughs> Uh, gangs, really, right? Often armed, either with opinions, fashions, declarations. Uh, again, all fictional. All stuff kind of made up in words and language. Yeah. But we don't really make multibird for anything true at all. When do we do that? Ever? And why don't we know how? Because right? obviously if we knew how, we would do that. Even when we come together for sports, we're doing it for fictions. Right? The teams won't accomplish anything truly heroic. Uh, what they'll do is play out a kind of a representation of heroism, which will drive us all into a mad frenzy of kind of absurd, delusional transference or projection or something. Yeah, so it's almost like our absence from heroism becomes the reason that we come together to glorify the fact that it once existed. It's really astonishing. I mean, what could be done with the collective intelligence, heartfulness, and active potential of a group of 10,000 people for four hours could change human history every time we tried it, right? But when we make multibird, something else happens. And in fact, human history is degraded and damaged, falsified. Our humanity is degraded. We are depersonalized. We become compliant with a representation of excellence, a rep representations of nobility, representations of unity, representations of our potential. We flock to films. We make multi-bird to go to see films of what apparently we have no idea how to become. And the strange thing is individuals can't really make multi-bird. So if we begin simply with the idea that we are individuals, um, a convenience that is certainly not concrete. Um, none of us individually learned language. We never individually acquired any skill. We never individually accomplished anything whatsoever. No author individually authored anything. No inventor individually invented anything. No, there are no individuals. Now, it's not that we have no aspects that are individual-like. Sure, we are provisionally individuals in a variety of ways that are true and real. Um, if someone touches my hand, your hand won't feel it, uh, unless you happen to be the one touching my hand. <clears throat> so there are, there are domains in which our individuality is reliably you know, distinct, but <laughs> in most domains, it's not. And in most of the domains in language uh, that we treat our individuality in, we have transported uh, 
uh, one aspect of, of the truth to dominate all other possibilities. And what, what's really true is that um, what we are as individuals changes if you put us in any context, especially with other, quote, individuals. Uh, I dramatically change in the presence of any other person. So it's hard to say that I had really specific, separate qualities. Whatever, I may have had some, but they are radically transformed the moment that the context changes. So um, I wasn't exactly an individual, and even the individual I am is some kind of a, hmm, a floating, transforming representation of all of the people and concerns and living beings and history of life on Earth and all of this. So sure, I'm, I'm conveniently in language an individual, but if we decide that we are concrete individuals and then create schemas and frameworks around that, well, that's all fiction. And then, of course, we can only come together under kind of fictional uh, imperatives right, and frameworks. And we'll forget what it means to make true multi-bird, except maybe for entertainment, right? You know, we all go in a group out and go camping or something. Yeah? But again, we're pretty much spectators. I mean, one of the questions that we have to ask here is, we can see what um, fake human multi-bird does and is interested in, fails to accomplish, complains about. Um, and it's funny because as individuals, we're all complaining about one fake multi-bird group or another or the lack of a real one like I am here or something like this. Yeah? So as fake individuals, we're all complaining that all the multi-birds don't work and that there's bad multi-birds out there and all of this. And everything's oriented around this, which is all nonsensical. The fact is that we're just not establishing any, anything like true uh, communion for noble purposes, uncorrupted by fictions, economies, religions, politics. Um, the, the, the sort of overlay of language and culture and structure. Right? We, uh, we need to be able to form together, spontaneously, uh, little groups of human beings that do amazing things with and for each other in the history of life on Earth. And, you know, we don't have to use those words or anything, but the organizing purpose has to be relatively true, self-correcting, based on rea reality relation, <clears throat> the possibility of learning and intelligence, self-correction and discovery. So we should notice that uh, we all go to form the fake collectives and even, you know, in our private time, online, uh, with our friends, what would, if, what would an effective collective even look like? How might it begin? Uh, how might it be organized without becoming a cult or another fiction, right? Uh, how, how would we put together uh, groups of humans committed to beautiful purposes with and for each other? that can operate independently from the overlay and perhaps inform or reinstruct it, or at the very least uh, be preserved from uh, the, the constant insistence of compliance uh, with all of its conflicted, bizarre, uh, hilarious, tragic, and catastrophic imperatives and results. And this is the question that we will answer together by, by just by beginning this conversation. Now we'll start to see into how to answer, how to become and give answer to it. And also the origins of the problem, right? Like what was missing? What did we not do uh, that became what we're doing now? How can we start to do some of that and see what the possibilities are? Uh, just by uh, talking about these things and looking into them carefully, we're beginning that process of learning um, how to form liquid, intelligent, fluidly self-correcting human collectives for purposes that matter to us, that are more effective, uh, and perhaps can even reinform 
The false collectives, which 90% of our lives and time is spent either serving or being destroyed by. And additionally, you know, the broader picture is what's the context? The context absolutely has to be the living ecologies of Earth. There's no possible fiction that can successfully disconnect our bodies, our minds, our future, our history from this. And the idea that we're somehow separate is an absolute fiction in language. Every single thing we're doing uh, in nature, particularly with technology, uh, is wiping us out and destroying aspects of a unified system. We haven't come close to understanding the identity or sophistication of. Uh, if we don't stop that kind of behavior with absolute immediacy and do something else, it won't much matter what we do in the future. There won't be much left to do anything with. Uh, even if we should survive, what it will mean to be human uh, will be such a tragic collapse of our potential and the possibilities of our incredibly paradisical planet that from here we consider them probably being worse than death. So it's very important that we stop tumbling down this mountain. You know, that uh, we seem to be excited about rushing downward um, from intelligence in relation with each other in nature to highly functional derivatives of fictions that everything serves and they're ripping the web of life and humanity on earth apart. Right? We each have to begin to join this conversation in our own way uh, and then to discover again how to form uh, fluid intelligent collectives with and for each other that will give us rewards that far exceed those of anything we can get from the fictional collectives to which for the moment we appear to be bound in mutual compliance, objection, subscription, and reflection. Thank you for joining me.